بالنسبة لإلهم؟ ايش كريستيان؟ Okay, so uh, I think we're going to look. We want to look at a bit of um, calcium nutrition, and what are some of the aspects and roles of calcium nutrition? What are some of the some of the challenges when we talk about calcium nutrition? Um, Just the overview of of each one of of the element, what function it has uh, in agronomy. So, firstly, when we look at the roles and the importance of calcium, um, there's two basic plant, uh, basic basic roles of calcium in plant. The one is that all of us know as a structural role, uh, with where it's a big part or very important part of of cell walls and cell membranes. And then one which is a little bit less known is it's as a messenger. Um, in the in the plant or in the in the cells, um, where calcium can actually almost uh, function as a plant growth hormone or plant growth regulator. Um, in some instances, but we're only going to touch on these really shortly. Um, looking at the first role, um, the structural roles in the cells. Um, one of the important aspects of calcium. Uh, Like yeah, yeah, the the pin you want to, yeah, like it's like this laser mark. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the very important roles of calcium <clears throat> is in this, in the, in the cell membrane. They have what we call the epidermis you know, of the cell, eh? So this is in the cell, so that's our cell wall. And you know, well, the epidermis is, is the outside of the cell. So it's, we, we have what we call, obviously, the cell wall, which is a rigid structure. And inside the cell wall, we have our cell membrane. And the cell membrane is a, is a fluid or is a um, movable or... or um, a fluid structure which can which can change its shape and move inside the plant but the cell wall is rigid so inside um, the plant cell wall um, we have what we find pectin now these pectin uh, molecules of uh, are very are very important calcium molecules that allows uh, cells to uh, or the cell wall or the cell membrane to um, to move and to be fluid. Oh, flexibility, and flexibility to the flexibility, flexibility, cell expansion. Um, uh, basically, the turgidity of the cell is all dependent oh. on pectin and the action of pectin. Um, and that's where that's where a lot. I mean. 60% of plant calcium we can associate with pectin. So, I mean, it's very important that we have at early plant growth stages or early plant developmental stages, um, stages like uh, flowering, flush, new flush, uh, pre, pre flush, pre flowering, any, any developmental stage. Um, Root growth. Where any any developmental stage where cell division basically is what we're looking at where cell division is taking place we need very good uh, availability of calcium inside the plant to be able to uh, synthesize these pectin chains because if we are calcium deficient very early during cell division the synthesizing of these pectin change uh, chains will be um, incorrect, and that's when we will have to get, we'll, we'll start getting problems with the uh, turgidity or the the the, wall, the expansion or the um, the basically the movement of the cell, and that's where we can have 
you know, cells bursting, uh, cell contents leaking out, leading to secondary infection, uh, all these type of things. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the very important structural roles of calcium in the plant, yeah. Um, looking at the second role as calcium as a messenger, basically what happens when the, the roots are, are um, realizing a salt or a drought stress, so basically... It can be uh, any sort of stress, eh, Willalem. It can actually be any sort of stress. It doesn't have to be salt and drought. It's just the... Any salt, yeah. Any any soil any soil stress based on um, changing of the hydraulic of not hydraulic the yeah the hydric potential so anything that's affecting the roots um, so it can be salt or drought or disease or eelworm or compaction or anything as anything affecting the hydric potential of the plant um, the calcium. Will, will act as a messenger and what it will do is it basically it's it's basically uh, working as a as a ionic signaling tool um, where it activates certain metabolic processes we know the abscisic acid pathway is one of the pathways that's activated by calcium um, so basically what the abscisic acid pathway is doing is that it's closing or it's sending the signal to close to mortar. So, for example, uh, we have a drought condition or a heat condition um, where the plant is realizing that it's, it's going into a drought stress or heat stress. And what it needs to do is it'll send that calcium molecule from the root cells um, into the plant to activate the abscisic acid pathway. And then, then the abscisic acid pathway again will send other signals to various plant uh, for uh, plant structures like leaves and and stems and 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 other roots to start or increase the uptake of water. But one of the other things that the abscisic acid pathway is doing is that it's activating the closure of our stomata. So within the plant, calcium is also a very important, uh, like I said, a messenger. Um, again, looking at uh, what stage of plant development or plant growth, this is important. If you want to have a functioning messenger or uh, a plant that's very, that's able to react very quickly to changing conditions, it's going to be important to have sufficient calcium available in that plant all through its life cycle. Um, when the plant is able to react to a stress condition quicker, um, we find that the plant has got more energy available. Uh, so we have, we see increased vegetative growth, increased yield, that type of thing when calcium is available. Uh, well, we through the plant. almost see it as a catalyst in the, in the plant's responses to, to nature. It buffers the plant's response. It, it, no. it's, uh, it buffers the stress because now the plant is able to, the, it does, the plant doesn't create more energy because of calcium, but it loses less yes. through stress. Yeah. Because it's more, it's more able to tolerate stress because it's able to activate its the responses faster. Um, so that's the second role of, of calcium as a messenger. There's a lot more in-depth explanation behind this, but we're only touching on this lightly today. Looking at what happens when we have low calcium in plants, in vegetables, uh, in, in uh, vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, chilies, uh, and then also our cucurbits, we find we can find blossom end rot. Um, also, we have creasing in citrus. We have high fungal or insect damage due due to uh, the the cell wall damage, like we explained earlier. Uh, fruit quality and shelf life is a problem, and then also fruit drop. Um, so basically all of these things are very common. We find very common in, uh, in agriculture. And we can see lack of calcium in most crops. Um, we find we can find certain periods of time where uh, calcium is deficient. Uh, maybe not for the whole season, but definitely certain periods of time 
when there's a very high demand in the crop, we find a lot of calcium nutrition. Pages, eh? Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Um, why, why calcium is so important for us? Because, I mean, in, in modern day agriculture, um, one of the most used and, and most probably important worldwide source of chemical fertilizer is nitrogen. And um, what happens with the, the nitrogen to calcium relationship, there's a very, very strong relationship between nitrogen and calcium, where they are actually antagonistic against each other, where they work against each other. Because what, what happens with nitrogen, because nitrogen is a vegetative growth stimulator. It'll increase, you know, increase the number of leaves. It increases the size of the leaf. When it increases the size of the leaf, obviously now this leaf needs more water because it's transpirating more. Um, so the plant is, is spending more energy feeding these bigger leaves, getting more water into the plant. And as soon as, as your nitrogen is too high, your nitrogen application start getting too high and you're not supporting that with calcium, then you'll find imbalances in the plant. And this is where we start seeing major problems like blossom end rot or uh, fruit drop um, or cracking or these type of, these type of things. So the big thing that we as, as agriculturists or growers need to do is we need to look at this nitrogen to calcium ratio and what can we do to to uh, decrease the nitrogen to calcium ratio, to get that to a ratio of 1.1. Um, again, looking at the, polo, the, the popular calcium so sources that we have available, uh, a lot of farmers use either gypsum or lime, depending on your pH. Gypsum has got a low solubility uh, at about 2.2 grams per liter of water. So when applying large volumes of gypsum, we need to be sure that the product is solubilizing and, and getting into the soil solution um, where it is plant available. The, the, the characteristic of gypsum, which makes it not very suitable for plant, um, for plant uh, as a source of calcium for plants is because it, it, it has a charged calcium cation. And when that, that charged calcium cation. So when the, the calcium sulfate associates in the soil solution, the association to calcium two positive cation and sulfate one negative anion. And what will happen then is the calcium two positive anion will react with the soil or with the clay particles and then become plant unavailable basically. So um, the interaction between the charged calcium cation in both gypsum and in lime um, makes it not ideal for plant nutrition in terms of calcium. Um, with lime, again, we, we have dolomitic and uh, calcitic lime. Very important to know which one to use. That your, your lime application, obviously determined by pH, and then looking at your calcium and magnesium ratios. Which will, which will determine which dolomitic or calcitic lime uh, should be used. Then looking at calcium nitrate, um, we can see calcium nitrate, it shows us as 19% calcium in the cationic form and nitrogen as N in 15%. Now we know that, that plants uh, doesn't utilize nitrogen as N, it's either utilized as ammonium or nitrates. So when we transform, let's say the plant available um, fraction of nitrogen coming from calcium nitrate, it's almost in a ratio of 3.4 parts of nitrate to one part of calcium. Now, even though when we look at calcium nitrate, we see that it's 19% calcium. So it looks like so it's a efficient calcium product, but actually it's not. Um, again, the calcium calcium nitrate, which is or calcium nitrate, which is a very soluble product, 
um, it'll react quickly in the soil. It quick, it'll become dissociated quickly in the soil solution. But again, because it's a charged calcium molecule, there can be interaction with soil particles and clay particles in the soil, blocking that calcium, making it not making it unavailable for the plants. I think for that, um, back to the previous slide, uh, with calcium nitrate being the most uh, dominant or say popular fertilizer choice for farmers for calcium. If you have a, a imbalance between nitrogen and calcium and you have to turn to something, you can't justify your calcium deficiency in your plant, which doesn't leave you with much options for the addressing stuff like blossom end rot. Um, exactly. The day for the farmer. Exactly. You're not fixing your problem. You, you're adding to your problem um, when you have this, this nitrogen to calcium um, imbalance and using calcium calcium nitrate. Uh, other big uh, is in um, stages when you want uh, reproductive growth, growth in a lot of like food sets and um, you don't want vegetative growth which nitrogen is a big contributor to. So uh, as well yeah. using, using a lot of nitrogen during critical reproductive stages like food set um, mm. calcium nitrate can lead to problems if you have already got high nitrogen levels in your plant. Yeah. The other problem, the other issue with calcium nitrate is if, if we looked here on the left is when we look at the salt index of fertilizers, um, this is basically looking at how much contribution the fertilizer is increasing the salt or the EC in the soil where we use sodium nitrate as our benchmark. Now we can see calcium nitrate has got a salt index of 65, <clears throat> which is which is relatively high, especially when we think of, of production of like tomatoes or peppers um, in a in a in a big um, sort of open hydroponics type soil system uh, grow system. So using a product like calcium nitrate, yes, gypsum. Okay, this is where gypsum and lime. I've got low uh, salt indexes, again, because of the solubility. But when we are adding two or three tons of gypsum or two or three tons of lime per hectare, we are putting a lot of salinity down. But the, the main influence be, or the, the main difference between gypsum and calcium carbonate and calcium nitrate is the solubility. But looking at calcium nitrate, if you're growing a tomato crop of uh, maybe using a ton of calcium nitrate, which is common in some in some cases, um, we are adding a lot of salinity to the soil. Now, if you are in conditions where uh, salinity is not an issue, you have well-drained soils, you've got low EC water, uh, low um, salinity or uh, low saline conditions, then calcium nitrate maybe you can get away with it. But if you are in uh, soils that's not very well, high, com high, highly compacted soils um, where your calcium to magnesium ratios are not in balance or uh, where you've got issues with water quality, then using calcium nitrate, uh, for me, they, you, we need to look at something else because with, with a high volumes of calcium nitrate, we're contributing a lot to EC. And uh, when we're increasing EC, the plants, the the plants just needs to spend so much more energy, you know, trying to to do its normal uh, normal biological processes, um, and then that's when we start losing uh, production potential. So again, now this is cool because now we can look at the factors that's affecting calcium availability and the movement to plants. We can look at the soil cation exchange capacity. We'll quickly touch on soil pH. Um, soil EC, water uptake and plant activity, we spoke to about it now a little bit, and then physiochemical properties of ions. So this is like the relationship between calcium and magnesium. Calcium and phosphorus is very important in this instance, and also calcium and iron can be very important in this instance. So again, we've, we've, we've all seen this little chart before. Basically, what the influence of our pH is on the availability of nutrients as the, for nitrogen, for instance, when uh, at low pHs, we see that nitrogen is, is becoming 
more available as pH is increasing and then from a pH of about 5.5 to call it 8.2, we have optimal availability of nitrogen. Calcium we see from about 6 to about, I would say, 8.3, we have optimal availability of calcium. Um, we know at low pH levels, uh, calcium availability is a problem or calcium availability in the soil, maybe not to the plant, but calcium, the, the, the physical quantity of calcium in the soil becomes a problem because at low pH conditions, calcium is easily leached from the soil, from the soil cation exchange capacity. So we start losing calcium uh, very rapidly. Um, so the, the optimal point in pH in the soil would be around 6.2, where you have a, the perfect mix between your micro and macro elements. Um, yeah. The optimal point. Yeah, about 6.2. Mm. 6.2, this is pH. I would say this is pH in water, not pH in KCL. Um, so again, we need to look at that. But what, what we don't see from this <clears throat> is again, when we, when we need to look at maybe something just like the calcium to phosphorus. And, but we need to look at the, the amount of calcium. In some soils where uh, uh, maybe old banana soils or old tobacco soils, where the soils have been cultivated, you know, constantly for many, many years, our phosphorus levels have increased to above 100 or even 150 ppm of phosphorus in the soil. Um, we find with these type of soils that we have a lot of calcium. Um, even we have some, we have a lot of calcium in the soil, but we very, very easily see calcium deficiencies, just due to the reaction of calcium and phosphorus in the soil, basically making both unavailable. Um, and uh, calcium fixation. Yeah, that, yeah exactly. Um, looking at the cation exchange capacity, basically. What, what is happening is that we have clay particles or even organic matter particles in the soil which are negatively charged, which binds cations. Um, we look at basically five cations that we talk about. Uh, there are more, but the, the four main ones are calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. Um, hydrogen, uh, zinc, uh, um, aluminium, all these other type of, of cations are also important, but our main ones are, are calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. Um, so what happens is that these cations react onto clay particles or organic matter particles. And then as the plant is, uh, as the root is, or as the plant is excreting uh, hydrogen cations, it's exchanging those hydrogen cations for uh, one, uh, one uh, potassium or one or two hydrogens for one calcium or two hydrogens for one magnesium. Um, so uh, this is how basically the plant is uh, interchanging or exchanging uh, protons or hydrogen ions onto the clay soils for uh, what we call our base, our base cations. And again, this is how the plant has got a, has got a acidifying action as well, because these, obviously these hydrogen cations are decreasing pH um, in, this, in the root zone. And again, then looking at this, that's where the plant can alter the pH in the root zone, you know, looking at making, at making certain nutrients unavailable or available depending on the pH. Um, now, this is important. This is basically where we look at CC saturation or the percentage of base saturation, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Now, this is, base, this is basically a, a average. Um, your ideal cation exchange or your ideal base, sat, base saturation percentage this will is, change. This is what a farmer must strive for at the end of the day. If it, if you yeah, it'll change. It'll change a little bit between sort of clay soils and sandy soils. When you have a very sandy soil, um, you would look at maybe having 75% of calcium or even 80% of calcium. 
But when you have a very clay soil with a high CC, uh, maybe 60 or even 65 is enough. Um, your base saturation changes slightly between uh, basically your soil texture. But as an average, we can, we can look at the following. We can say we want at least 70% of calcium in our soil, 15% of magnesium, 5% uh, of potassium, less than 2% of sodium, and then our other uh, uh, cations in the soil makes up 8% of, 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 of our cation exchange. So basically, on all the negative charges of all the clay in the soil, we want 70% calcium, we want 15% magnesium, uh, we want 5% potassium. So 70% of all the negative charges in the soil needs to be saturated with calcium. And this is where we have a lot of problems. Um, this is where the, um, the interaction of uh, the cation exchange capacity or our clay particles and the type of fertilizer that we are using is very important because here we can see that of all the bases here that we're talking about, uh, the soil has got the highest affinity for calcium. The soil wants the most calcium out of all the other bases. And that's why when we use uh, fertilizer products that are charged, um, they are they, they very easily drawn into the soil. They're very easily absorbed onto the cation exchange uh, sites on the clay particles. And they basically become plant unavailable. The other thing that's very important, that's very important with the calcium, calcium to magnesium ratio is our soil compaction. We can have basically two types of compaction um, where we lose soil structure. One is a calcium to magnesium imbalance. The other one is a calcium to sodium imbalance. Um, mainly we talk about uh, compacted soils where we talk about calcium to magnesium ratios where there's, where there's an imbalance and we talk about uh, deflocculated soils when there's an imbalance between sodium and calcium. Um, what we find with soil that's flocculated, that's got a very good structure, you can see between our soil particles, we have good uh, micropores and macropores. Here we can see the relationship of the size of the different cations and the different roles of these cations. So we can see that calcium is a, is a large to medium sized cation, which is um, highly active and um, a lot, uh, there's a lot of calcium in the soil. And the role of calcium here is to increase the area or increase the size around the soil particles. Um, again, looking at that ideal calcium to magnesium ratio of four to five to one parts of, of magnesium. When we have a compacted soil, our calcium ratio is less than three. Um, and here you can see the, the, the activity of calcium now is lost because magnesium is a much smaller particle or much smaller cation. Now our soil particles are becoming closer to each other. And this is causing problems obviously for water movement, for air movement, for root growth, um, basically all the conditions that we need for, for, for active plant growth is now being limited. And now we have chemically compacted soils. Now again, this is one reason why we need to increase our calcium levels to these ideal levels, to find the ideal relationship between calcium and magnesium for very well flocculated soils. And this is a lot why we use a lot of, of products like gypsum um, in you know, modern agriculture, because we are also thinking of our soil. And uh, this is a very important use and for me, the best, the best way to do this is through regular applications of gypsum. Um, obviously, our activity of gypsum is dependent on the size of the particle. We've seen that gypsum is not very soluble. It takes a long, long time for it to become soluble. So if we can apply a finer particle to the soil, um, the reaction time for the calcium to start reacting in the soil particle is a lot less. So this is something like a micronized uh, gypsum. Even the liquid gypsum products are very good as they are working quicker. So 
what I've always recommended is to use a combination of coarse granular and finer gypsum products to have a very quick uh, reaction combined with this low aquifer, slow, slow release type uh, calcium reaction as well. Um, why, why calcium is so important for the soil and why it's so um, difficult to become available is because of this. This is the, when we look at the, the soil colloid, so this is the, this is the clay colloid, um, the clay particle in the soil. As the, the, the cations are, are closer to the, to the soil colloid, obviously it's got a much higher or much stronger interaction with it. Um, as the particles are far further away from the clay colloid, the interaction or the strength of the interaction between the clay colloid and the particle is less. So basically what we can see is um, in the, in the, uh, the stern layer close to the colloid, we have a, a very strong calcium interaction. And this is basically that uh, percentage of the base saturation from zero to 70 or 65% of the cation exchange capacity. So as soon as that stern layer is saturated with calcium, now uh, calcium is not being, uh, the soil is saturated in calcium and it's not um, being attracted to that soil colloid as, as strongly as below uh, or when that layer is not saturated. So now we have calcium in the diffuse layer and now we also start finding calcium in the soil solution. And this is only here when calcium is in the diffuse layer and the soil solution, when we will start having calcium available to the plant. Um, again, looking at this, this is a very interesting, um, very interesting slide for me, is sometimes when we look at our soil, soil analysis, we can see, okay, our soil, we have a, a soil PPM of 1,500 units of, of calcium. Um, and looking at a CEC of 69.5%, which is a, which is an okay level. Um, obviously, your PPM depends on your soil PPM, and the if it's enough or not will depend on your on your soil texture. But looking at our percentage of of calcium, of calcium, yes, we can see our soil is 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 actually almost perfect. Um, looking at what we've just said, but then looking at the paste extraction or the actual calcium in the, in the soil solution, which is plant available, we can see compared to 1,500 PPM of calcium in the soil, compared to 14.2 uh, PPM of calcium in the solution, we can see actually in this case, calcium is not available. Um, very very low levels of calcium is available so again when you want to actually know exactly what's going on with my calcium availability in the soil we need to look at the soil ppm we need to look at the soil uh, analysis and look at the calcium levels in the soil and then also we need to look at the paste extraction or our soil soil moisture um or the 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 yeah the Soil solution around the plant will give us a very good indication of what's happening with plant available calcium. Um, now, we've seen some of the challenges of calcium nutrition and calcium uptake. Now from Cosmosol, um, we have a product called Mainstay Calcium. Um, we find that this product works excellent as a standalone calcium source. Um, Obviously, for the plants, um, we'll, come, we'll get to that now. So what's, what's, what's the advantages of using a product like Mainstay Calcium is we have a calcium product without nitrogen. Um, the calcium in Mainstay Calcium is in the form of a calcium, uh, of a, of a, a calcium molecule complexed with a carboxylic acid. So we use uh, calcium carbonate or lime as a raw material using nanotechnology we're able to separate the calcium from the carbonate molecule and we filter the carbonate molecule out of the product then we complex the calcium with a very sp uh, specific carboxylic acid and 
this carboxylic acid has got a very high affinity for calcium and this um, the bond between the calcium and the carboxylic acid will only dissociate below a pH of about four. Um, so this means that when it's only inside the plant, this um, basic complex will will dissociate. So it doesn't it, it doesn't react in the soil because um, that that calcium carboxylic acid complex is actually seen to the plant as an organic complex or as an organic compound. So it, it changes the way that the plant is absorbing calcium. Um, it's not um, under the influence of general ideas or general uh, theories of calcium movement because it's, it's being taken up and moved as an as organic molecule. Um, we've said uh, We've said fast uptake and mobilization in the plant. Again, it doesn't have a charge. Uh, when, you, when you test the EC or basically the salt index of a product like mainstay calcium, I would say it would be the same as gypsum or lime. Um, I think it's important to say it does have an EC. It's just protected with the carboxylic acid. So it, it still yeah. has a fundamentally calcium in it. It's just... Uh, Micro encapsulated to to be not to react um, with unwanted reactions and to be more plant available. Exactly, exactly. Um, so we see it's got a high concentration. I mean, uh, I say calcium. I think is uh, twenty percent calcium. Um, and yeah, like you said, it's uh, it's the only product with micro shield technology. So this means that there's, there's no interaction, there's no reaction between the calcium and the soil particles, and it's 100% plant available form of calcium. Um, this is this is basically what's happening with with normal calcium. Um, this can be this is any charged calcium from. Oh, so this is sorry. This is the calcium from calcium mainstay uh, from where. There's no interaction because we can see that the charge is, is not um, shown when we look at the uh, calcium mainstay. So there's no interaction between the soil particles or other nutrients in the soil. When we look at other fertilizer products, again, we can find reactions in the soil or onto soil particles or with other products, with other nutrients in the soil. And that which is making, uh, in this case, calcium and phosphorus unavailable to the plant. So we have 100% plant available calcium, which moves very easily into the roots, um, basically because it's seen as a as an organic compound. Um, yeah, mainstay calcium. Uh, again, like we said, like I said earlier, very important stages. Uh, basically right through right through the crop cycle um, when we look at trees and vegetables uh, pre-flower flower and set is very very important periods uh, this is where a lot of biomass is is manufactured a lot of cell division is taking place and this is where we can influence the yield a lot um, so during these this is a critical period so I would say focus a lot of, 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 of your calcium nutrition in, in, the, in those stages. And then also with root flush. Um, we know that calcium is very important for root growth. And again, mainstay calcium is a very good product for, for stimulating and increasing root growth and, and also very fine root air growth. So during a root flushes, it's also a very important period uh, to apply mainstay calcium. On vegetables, we recommend almost a weekly application um, of around almost two to five liters per hectare can be applied. I think it's important. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if you look. Yeah, I think it's important. Yeah. It, is a, it is put through the fertigation. It's optimal to put it through your irrigation. So as a, as a, as a fertigation. And uh, it can also be applied as a folia, but it was designed to be put through the the irrigation system for optimal 
um, benefit of the product. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, what we'll do is we'll add our, our emails to this uh, video. If there's any questions, you can find us on our website uh, or on our Facebook page. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for listening and thanks for Alam. Yeah, good. If there's any questions, please be in contact. Sure.